This is Don't Get Me Started. This is a conversation about advertising. And here is your host, freelance creative director and creative circus department head, Dan Balser. Yes, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. If you're paying close attention you, and you're, you're a regular listener to this, which first of all, I pity you and thank you at the same time for listening to this more than once, you'll notice my voice is raspy and I can't figure out if it's if it's like fall, late summer allergies or if I have a legit infection of some kind. My voice is hoarse. It could be just that I go to a lot of soccer games and I yell a lot at professional soccer games. Um, as you, the uh, listener, already know, um, this conversation is with Matt Reinhardt. We have not started talking. I don't know how the conversation is going to go, but I'm anticipating based on just meeting him today at lunch that it's going to be easy. Uh, I think we're of the same um, vintage, uh, advertising vintage. I think we, we kind of came up at the same in the same era, different parts of the country, different tracks. Um, and if you're also a, a longtime listener of this show, then you know two years ago we had his uh, partner of 24 years, Tom O'Keefe as a guest on the show, and you might want to go back and listen to that for some context. And I think there's going to be some overlap because there was some philosophical consistency between both presentations um, when they spoke at Forum here at the Creative Circus. Uh, Matt Reinhardt is the son of Keith Reinhardt, who you may know if you're an advertising uh, student of the business, um, a legend uh, before my time. Um, and um, I'm going to read Matt's bio off the website because... I know you're savvy enough, listener, to have found a podcast on the internet. I know that that's something that my parents and grandparents would never have even conceived of understanding, much less being able to actually find the podcast. But I also know that you tend to be a low-hanging fruit generation of people who like to have things handed to them. Therefore, it's unlikely that you've actually gone on the internet and researched O'Keefe, Reinhardt, and Paul and looked at the bio for my guest today. So I'm going to make it easy for you. I'm going to spoon feed it directly into your ears. Matt's soulful approach to both the work and workspace environment sets the culture at O'Keefe, Reinhardt, and Paul. A well-traveled creative director with a designer's eye, career highlights include celebrated campaigns for Amazon.com, Taco Bell, Electronic Arts, and Fox Sports. Before co-founding OKRP, Matt served as internal creative director at Amazon.com. Matt's work has been recognized by the Clios, One Show, New York Art Directors Club, and Sundance Film Festival. A mentor to the talent at OKRP, his creative philosophy is best summed up by the agency's guiding principle of have soul. I can tell already this, this is the kind of creative person who's sitting here a foot away from me. And it's always <laughs> awkward to talk about a person in third person as they're sitting here. There's a, there's a honesty and a genuine authenticity and vulnerability about, about Matt that I think is one of the things that enables great creative work and help, has helped O'Keefe, Reinhardt, and Paul grow and be successful for half a decade. So first off, Matt, thank you for coming in. Welcome to the microphone. It's great to meet you. Thank you for having me. Was that was that a fair was that a fair setup? You think that's a great setup? Okay. Yeah. Anything anything sounded wrong? No, that? not at all. Um, I think uh, it reminds me of a a thing that we kind of say around the office, which is we like things that are perfectly imperfect. Oh, that's and good. and I think you know that that gets into a little bit of the having soul, uh, being vulnerable, but being real. And um, I think we we tend to come across communication that's scrubbed within an inch of its life, and it right. communicates what it's supposed to communicate, but it doesn't make me feel anything. And I think what we try to do is make people feel number one good about themselves, and number two good about the relationship that they may have with this product that we're selling. Yeah, it's, it's analog versus digital. And it's analog in that it's never the same way. This is reminds me, when you're saying that, I don't know why this popped into my head. I think it's because of this old Amazon stuff that you just showed. When Amazon, people don't remember, younger people don't remember that when Amazon started, Amazon.com was an online bookstore. You'd order books and books would come. So the task that the, where were you at the time when you worked on that original Amazon stuff? In Sa in San Francisco. What agency? It was at FCB San Francisco, oh. and that was 1999. Right. So it's the Y2K reference. Right. So there's a Y2K reference, and there was also just, uh, it was basically, the, the, the objective of the commercials was to let people know that there's a lot of stuff you can order. But it felt like it was done on videotape, 
and you had these guys that were turning towards the camera in one of the spots spelling out this this inane, inane acronym and they didn't turn on the right time and everything had this this feeling of 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 authenticity to it that reminds me of this Neil Young went on this whole rant when digital music started about how the human brain will literally memorize a song after you've heard it two times on digital because there's a finite number of bits of information they're giving to you. Whereas when we grew up listening to records, you play the same record over and over again because it's a physical groove that's never the same way twice. And there's something about that sort of moment of real that doesn't exist. And you're talking about that in advertising and motion pictures where everything is everything is in its perfect place. And it there's some sort of trigger in our minds that that reads, I think, as less accessible, less human, less warm. I think less accessible is absolutely right. You know, less approachable. Right. Um, if it's so perfect, then maybe it's too good for me. Um, well, that's, but, in, that's interesting. You know, yeah. but but if it is accessible and vulnerable, then I can have a conversation with it. And there I can then have a relationship with it. I mentioned your dad. I didn't want to get into a whole thing about like following your father's footsteps because I think that's a, you probably answered that question on interviews a half a dozen times. But I, I am curious about how you started off in the business and um, having not gone to an advertising school and just sort of talk about how how you started off in advertising. Great. Um, <clears throat> I I was fortunate enough to go on location to uh, such faraway places as Hollywood, California at the age of five wow. where they had the set built, the stage built, they would keep the stage set up for McDonald land. Hmm. And that's where you had uh shake falls and the goblins and the mayor McCheese and all that stuff. So I was, uh, I got a good peek into that world at an early age. Um, we often listened to uh, radio on uh, the tape cassette, um, in the station wagon on mm -hmm. weekends and listen to, um, uh, there was a Shasta was a beverage that, oh, uh, I used to listen to, um, hubba bubba bubble gum. You're talking about commercials. Yes. Yeah. We would listen to radio spots or jingles of name of uh, bubble bub bub yeah. gum. Yeah. I remember the jingle for hubba bubba bub bub bubble gum. Yeah. Oh yeah, no. Hubba Bubba was supposed to be the one that didn't stick to your face. That, That's was, right. Was that the That's right. point of difference with that one? Yes, that was going up against Bubble Yum. Bubble Yum, which uh, the playground uh, lore was that there were Black Widow spider eggs in Bubble Yum. See, that's interesting. That that was your that was your playground lore. You know what my playground lore around Bubble Yum was? That hmm. it was black market stuff you couldn't buy east of the Mississippi. Oh. So people would go on. <laughs> I went to a private school where the kids would go on ski trips. And they'd come and home back. in January with black market bubble yeah. yum and sell them for like a dollar a piece. And they were, because you'd never seen a block of gum like that yeah. that made your mouth explode. It was yeah, always square. Just, yeah. Yeah, it's like Coors. You know, you have to go to Colorado right. to bring it back. It's literally exactly what it yeah. was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> black Widow inside it? Yes. It was kind of like in around the same time that Mikey, uh, who wouldn't try life cereal, um, Did, he, he supposedly had passed because he ate. Uh, pop rocks and then drank a coke. Yeah, that that, that and happened. His stomach. Exploded. Well, these are the memes of our generation. Yes, these are the memes of our generation that were like just passed by word of mouth. And there's probably little teeny bits of truth of multiple stories webbed in webbed. See, I just slipped into the spider. I'm obsessed with the spider. It's spiders. The spiders thing. are big. So, so you were. So, was it something that you ever? When did you kind of realize this is a viable career, or did you kind of default, kind of ramp into it? Like, how did, how did that happen? Because. Uh, um, I look at your resume. I don't see ad school in there. I see DePaul University in Indiana. Where where did you grow up? First I, of all? I grew up in Evanston, Illinois. Okay, and uh, so just right outside of Chicago. All right, and um, did theater. Uh, you know, we were we were lucky to uh, have a great theater department. Mm -hmm. um, I did go to school with a, a variety of folks who went on to successful careers. Oh, cool. Um, I mean. I'm going to say, you know, John Cusack, Joni Cusack. Oh, you knew those guys. Um, That's cool. Uh, Steve Pink, Leli Demos, uh, D.V. D. Vincentis. Wow. Um, so, you know, that was a, a very rich... Very Chicago. Uh, very Chicago. Very Chicago thing. Yeah. I was doing improv classes in fourth grade. Um, and um, I just... Did you buy into that then? Did you like it? I liked it, it okay, but I, I it wasn't exactly for me. I liked... Right. I liked production mm -hmm. um but i love drawing 
Um, Mm -hmm. You know, drawing was, you know, I was going to be a cartoonist. I interviewed at Chicago Tribune to work with Dick Locker, Mm. who did the Dick Tracy cartoons for the Tribune. You'd still do that? You still draw? I still draw. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So I drew my own storyboard. So that was one of those things where it's like you didn't really want people to know that you could draw your storyboards, right, but they right. would find out. Right, that's what you're going to be doing now. Yes. And the other groups, and the other team storyboards. Yes. Can yeah. you, just, do you have time Could you draw that? theirs, <laughs> too? <laughs> yeah. So the first job was in a studio. First of all, explain for the listeners who are in their 20s what a paste-up room slash studio looked like in the 90s. A paste-up room, some people called it the bullpen, right? Uh, the mount room. But it was a place where art directors would come in, and your job was to take these 20 by 30 blackboards and put anywhere from six to eight four by six frames of illustrated storyboards together, and you would spray the back of them. You'd be cutting out Mm -hmm. four by six storyboard frames. Physical stuff. Physical stuff. There was a vent that you were supposed to turn on, which would take the spray mount fumes away from your lungs um, as you were kind of spraying, you know, 10 minutes before the client presentation. Right. So uh, my job was to uh, cut those frames out, put them in order, lay them down, and then, you know, use the little were burnisher to kind of like you know, smooth them out and were everything. You, were you reading them? Were you looking at them? I was looking at them, yeah. yeah. You, was that your own? Were you self-educated at that point? Kind, kind of, of yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what it was. It's like the storyboards then get turned into, then once you sell something, you... Did you ever, wait, did you ever look at these boards and think like, ah, like that should say this, or I would have written it differently? I mean, were you kind of starting to think about yourself as a creative at that point? Like, uh, I think I was, I was probably more like, okay, this is what it is. This is how you do it. You know, mm-hmm. person walks into a room, cut to... I mean, it was kind of like scenes, you know? It right. was like stage direction, yeah, 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 yeah. which I understood from theater mm-hmm. um did a lot of musicals um boys from syracuse and uh sheer luck holmes were some of my highlights sheer luck holmes sheer luck holmes uh it was a sherlock holmes spoof yeah i think i picked that up is that an original production there was a, yeah it was with the uh, the local church okay um and uh and um and so, so you start to kind of see like okay i see how 30 second you know, TV scripts are kind of boarded mm-hmm. out and, mm-hmm. and what that entails. And honestly, as I graduated from the Mount Room to become a junior art director um, in Chicago, I found myself quickly doing television. And um, I was doing Payless Shoe Source commercials. And uh, uh, S.C. Johnson had a, a product. It was a potpourri product that you would sprinkle on your carpet called Nature's Collection. And so I was... Uh, Isn't that crazy what we remember? It was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, you go out and you, you, you work with directors and you work with music houses and, you you know, you get in studios. And I just think that whole maker environment, whether it was the professional studios we used back then or kind of the, kind of the room that we're in right now is very similar to the room that we started off with at OKRP where it was you underneath a blanket and a microphone in order to kind mm, of like right. get the sound yeah. levels down. Yeah, this is the best room in the school, and I'm sorry to the listeners that we've already heard a bunch of noise. Um, so what agency was that? Where were you? That was FCB FC, Chicago. Right, so... 1990. It's pretty unlikely that someone's going to come going to parlay that job into an art director job today, isn't it? I mean, is that something... That, I don't know if that job exists anymore. It doesn't exist anymore, no. Um, and I do believe that because of all the, the, the training... You know, that's the classic came out of the mail room. Right. I mean, the mount room was mm-hmm. the next... It was next door to the mail room. Right. Um, and um, I think... I think that opportunity does exist, but you know that was about hustling, and uh, and just asking constantly the creative directors: Is there anything that I could be thinking yeah, of for that's you? That's really great. That's great. I mean, I remember the CDs, and I'd be like, "If you need some promotional Canada Dry ginger ale billboards created, that all the only artwork I had was a bunch of lemons, give it to me, and I'll 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 come up with it." Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so I didn't go through I didn't go through the whole resume, but you went through a map in the presentation of all these different moves. And there was agencies in Chicago. There was draft FCB out west. There was a DDB, I believe, out west. Um, there was some work on Amazon right when they started. There was an eventual move up to the north. 
Pacific Northwest to actually work in at Amazon. Um, I w the questions I want to ask you are, you know, did you ever make a move that was the wrong move? Did you ever make a move that was for money? I was been talking about this all week with classes about 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 the career trajectory for a student is longer than you think it is, and it's more circuitous than you think it is when you're in, when you're in school. You think you're going to get out and get a job, and you're on the track, but the track is sort of a meandering track. And are there moves that you think um, were the wrong ones that ended up being, you know, educational for you, or yes. were there things that yeah. that you did that were great? sort of seminal, important milestone moves in your career. And what I want you to sort of frame the answer by thinking about what was your mindset at the job that you left and what got you to want to take those leaps or those moves? Um, the first one that I took was um, the first agency to another agency move that I made was Tom and I left FCB and we went to Ogilvy because we had this opportunity to work on Wilson Sporting Goods. Right, but both in Chicago. Both in Chicago. It was 94 or 5. 4. Yeah. Oh, and wow. and it was there was a there was a uh there was a we David made... and Goliath spot that was made and we thought, "Wow, this is the Nike. I mean, we're going to be doing Nike type work for Wilson." And I think we did one John Daly spot, which mm. I wish I'd brought that. Mm -hmm. That's when he won the British Open at St. Andrews. So we had access to that footage. But um, that was a move that was, that was probably, that was pride, ego, and uh, probably some money. Like the marginally wrong reasons. Yeah, it, that one was the wrong reason. Um but uh, I think uh, Jeff Thompson at the time said, are you guys done with your little experiment? Oh, wow. <laughs> and, From FCB? Yes, and so we kind of came back with our uh, tails, between. tails between our legs. Um, but it was good because it, it said, you know what, it's not bad where, where we are. Well, that's really important, I think, yeah. It, you know what, and and I will say, sometimes you know you want to leave because you get frustrated. You get You leave because I think I'm better than this. And it's like, you know what, patience... That's probably something I should have said again in the room to the in the forum. But patience is huge, and it, and again in this world that we're being born into right now, where our attention spans are shorter and shorter, patience is harder and harder. And self patience and being patient with, you know what? Can I be part of the change? Because no, a lot a lot of times people want the change ha to happen. And they don't realize that they can actually help affect the change. That's interesting. Do you feel like there's a that there's a power in the hires under you? Okay, I can't even say O'Keefe, Ryan Hardball. What are yeah. the letters? OKRP. OKRP. <laughs> do you feel like that there, that there's an opportunity for someone to do that? And I know exactly what you're saying. You you feel like when you're you know mid level or junior person that you're kind of you're kind of narrowly in a, as as a cog, and like I can't really affect anything and like all that kind of stuff is that is that a false narrative in their mind from your perspective now no i i think i think it exists because i think uh number one people respect the kind of elders i've been using mm -hmm. that term a lot lately to describe myself yeah. um i don't know why it's funny elders talking um and am i really a am, can i really kind of bring up my feeling towards this without for fear of some sort of repercussions that say, well, wait a minute, like, what do you mean by that? You know, I don't think Tom and I are like that. We do like to kind of um, espouse a bit of this egoless creativity where ideas can come from everywhere and the, the atmosphere that we try to create is an and atmosphere. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. hey, that's a great idea. And if you did this, you know, we try to be additive with that. But that's still kind of like a fundamentally new muscle for people to kind of use, especially if they are coming from an atmosphere where I am competitive against, you know, me and my partner are trying to beat the crap out of right. the partners across the hallway. And, right. and, and again, Jeff Thompson, our ECD in Chicago and then in San Francisco, he had it great. He had me and Tom, and we wanted to beat any other team that was working on any other project. Whatever they did on their stuff, we wanted to do our stuff even better than they would be mm. doing their stuff. So that competitive environment does exist. So that's that's probably a healthy competitive. 
healthy competitive. Because so you're saying you're competing on the work you're doing versus the work they're doing. You want to get more notoriety and more more traction. Not that you're you're sort of in a jump ball situation. No, it was uh, we wanted our pieces of business to be fun and popular right, and right, people right, right. love the work uh, more than people loved exactly <laughs> you know the, their Something. work so 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 our environment right now i think it's um i think it's a fine line between hey we want to try to teach some things at the same time we want to be blown away um, by some thinking as well too mm-hmm. so so you may not, may not have an answer to this next question but were there any moves that when you got there you're like oh shit shit, what did I do? And it turned out great. I think the move to Amazon was, there was definitely, I mean, there were key cards that wouldn't open certain doors. Hmm. It was So this like, is your more recent. This was the more recent. Right, to actually uh, go in, in-house to I went on. inside and it was, I felt like Jason Bourne, um, kind of like, what's going on here? It was a very <clears throat> need to know environment. Mm-hmm. Um, Interesting. which is normal as you, as you are innovating products on one floor and operating current products on another floor. Um, it's a, it's a, it's an incredible environment. Um, it is a startup still mentality. Um, there were moments where you were like, holy, holy shit, this is, this is real. Yeah. Um, and, and it is a moment in time. So it was historical in the shock and awe of it. So you were um, you're a creative director on Kindle Fire, is that yes, what it was? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um and uh and it was it was very exciting. <clears throat> it probably wasn't sustainable mm. um as a family, as a father and a, and a, and a husband, because the, it was it's intense. It's, it's super okay. intense. It's super intense. So So um, what 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 have you taken from that? What what sort of um traits or lessons have you have you kind of kept from those those months or years i think i think um you know uh the, gratitude for it not being like that <laughs> well yes um a lot of type a's um mm-hmm. a lot of alphas mm-hmm. involved a lot of uh business school like graduates Stanford kids right? yes yeah. uh carnegie no offense. carnegie michigan you know just intense you know yeah. and uh i'm more of an omega myself there you go <laughs> and uh in the back of the line yeah i'm more of an explorer or like way out there and not yeah. uh not not needing to kind of be in control you know mm. part of it is like you can't control everything <laughs> so one thing that i've noticed about people who like to control everything is when life happens and it's out of control they get extremely frustrated yeah. because they are not in control. Right. And I think a lot of my experiences have helped shape the fact that you can't control everything. Right. And you got to ride it. You know, you can only hope to contain it, I think, is the ESPN uh, line. Right, right, right. You know, you can only hope to contain it. You yeah. can't, you can just, you got to ride it. That's good. It's, it's, that's a learned skill, man. That's, that's a hard one for me early in the career, too. To deal with, like, hard left turns, hard right turns, stops, those kind of things. It's, it's frustrating. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, who's, who has been the best, uh, creative director you ever worked under and, and why? Um, you know, there's, a, uh, I'm trying to think several. Well, let's just say who's been one of the best just so that you're not eliminating anyone. Uh, what I, what I loved working for Jeff Thompson was, is he really was like, you guys are going to solve it. But that's awesome. So it, it's like, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to solve it for you. I'm going to give you, I'm going to guide you and give you my thoughts, great. but you guys are going to solve it. And that kind of accountability, you know, I, I can only hope that we could try to kind of instill that kind of confidence in, in other cool. folks as well too. But Jeff really trusted that we would solve it and we would kill ourselves in order to get there. So he was a great leader in that way where he, he trusted us to know like, we're going to come in with three to four campaigns and each one of them is going to, you know, <laughs> you never want to bring in something that you don't want to sell. Uh huh. And so we are going to make sure that the, even the worst one is something that we could live with. Over time, have you always had the sense that you and Tom are going to have something like every assignment? Did you feel like you're going to have something that you could that you'd be happy with, or were there times you're like, "Shit, we just..." I, I mean, 
We always, we always, we, uh, they called us 911, the 911 oh, boys. Because if it was a, it was a, if it was a nightmare, they were like, get Matt and Tom on this. Because we, we like the hot pressure yeah, that's great. situations. Yeah. Now, there were times when, um, I'd say in the Snapple years, I think Tom, uh, either, <laughs> either once had to take me to the hospital to make sure that I, my nerves weren't cracking. And then I think he just took the classic approach to, let me just take you out to a bar and get you a shot of whiskey. Right. Um, and so... You but, still have those moments? No. I don't, I don't have those moments anymore. In fact, I think now that I know what I know, the pressure of... The pressure I put on myself is, is maybe a little more... I understand what that is. Versus the pressure that is kind of unknown. That right. is like, okay, well, I've got some people who might be talking about me um, right. in another room and, and 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 judging me on something. It's like here I can kind of judge myself, and my clients can judge me, mm-hmm. you know. And so I think when you're in a larger environment or a larger corporation, there's so many unknowns that that unknown anxiety is what is the worst anxiety. It At least. Me. At least a known anxiety. At least a known anxiety. I can kind of pinpoint it and be like. You can get your hands on it and figure out a solution for it. It's like I visited a friend, and I might have mentioned this on the podcast. I visited a friend in New York who works at a big shop, huge shop, and he kept referring to they. He said, they're going to move us next week or they're going to have this thing. And they had, they always, they're always talking about how they're going to reshuffle the floor and they're going to give us this or they're doing this. I'm like, God, you just have no idea what's going to happen. And. I guess you could say that that's a known unknown that like you know something, but that's not the same as like a, a massive problem that you can stare at, and you can you can solve a problem. You can't solve a problem you don't know. I know when a client's not happy. That's so not bad. I that's good. Yeah, that's a good problem. That's yeah. a good. I I can get my hand around that anxiety. How do I solve that problem? Yeah, that's the best. Yeah. Um. So. I did tip you off to this question at lunch. I'm curious to know the answer. What personal trait of yours do you think has served you best so far in the career? I think um, patience is definitely one. I think you know is that, I, is that a new thing for you? Or is that, no, okay, no. that's cool. I, I think I think I think the fact that things are going to happen that are out of your control is is uh, is where, part of it. Where are you in your birth order? I am the middle. Yeah, that sounds right. Of five. That sounds right. Um, and I also have two other I don't know, sisters. I don't know any patient firstborns. Uh, is your older sibling oldest sibling a patient person? He's not impatient, um, <laughs> but he's very um, pe- the, the peculiar. Middle, the middle child is the ultimate go with the flow, I think. Yes. Right. Yeah. I think I'm the referee. Um, I'm the go with the flow. Um, so patience has served me well. Listening. I think I'm a, I think, I think I'm a great listener. Um, I, uh, what does that mean? What does, I, that, what does like it feel to, like? What does it feel like to listen? Like, what do you, how do you listen well? How does one listen well? And this is a philosophical question. You may not have an answer to it. It's more of a discussion question. Sure. Like how, how do you listen? I think you listen because you're trying to interpret what a lot of people have a hard time saying what they mean. And so part of the listening skill is to say, we've listened to you. I I heard what you said, and I am now solving for the the thing that you said, or the statement that you made, or the strategy that you that were having a hard time articulating. And I listened so that I can interpret and create or play back for you. I think this is what you meant. And when people feel like you listen to them, um, because you did listen to them, mm-hmm. and you play back, um in a creative solving kind of way, all of a sudden they're like, Oh my gosh, I love this relationship with my agency Mm -hmm. because they listen to me. Yeah. And, and I feel more a part of the plan, a part of the idea, a part of the conception of the campaign or the idea that this is a partner. And we talk about partnerships. Partnerships are, are critical. Yeah, really important. But listening is a big part of that. So I do believe that that's a trait. I'm also, um, yeah, I'm also a freak for design and, you know, set direction and stuff like that. So, but I think listening is the big, is the Mm, big piece because it is a business. 
if I could have a gallery and just paint all day, I would love to do that too, but I'm not there yet. Yeah, it's interesting because that kind of leads me a little bit into my next question about success and happiness. Is like having your own place the happiest you've been? Is it the easiest or the best way to be happy? Because you did mention working for the man. And I think there are some people who are probably pretty damn happy working for the man. Um, has for you having your own place been sort of a key to, to being this? Would you say this is probably one of the happier sections of your career? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, we are kind of. Does it go back to accountability? What you were talking about before? I think it's about accountability. I think it's about being able to make choices um, as a small team of me and my two partners and kind of agree or agree to disagree mm -hmm. on things, but in a way where, hey, it's the three of us or it's the kind of the, the other partners that we've, we've brought in. Um, that, that kind of thing feels that it feels good because that unknown pressure doesn't exist. Right. I kind of know all the pressure points. You, you know? guys are an independent agency. We're expanding, you know. Are you so, independent? Yes. Okay, that's huge. So we're we're independent and we, you know, we're expanding. So we're going to go open up another 4,000 square feet on the floor below us. And we're going to kind of set up our production down there. We're going to move our production unit from eighth floor down to seven. Um, I do a lot of work on the interior. I designed our oh, offices. Cool. And so I like to make things. Yeah. <laughs> so when we talk about is this the most satisfying or happy I've been? Yeah, because I like to make things. Are you, this is a weird one. Are you scared about getting too big? Is that? I think up? we're, we're starting to, uh, to read the, um, Jay Shiat, um, <laughs> How big do you have to be before you get bad? Mm -hmm. You know, that's a that study about the tribal size of one twenty five. Yes, and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, Paul Lavoie at Taxi was someone who also kind of spoke to me um, years ago about like once you hit a hundred, then we'll open up a Montreal. They're in Toronto, and um, they opened up a Montreal office. You know, to avoid to avoid too much in one. To avoid too much in one, and to avoid too big and kind of i don't know everybody right um i don't have that same feeling and we we've seen that as we've gone from 25 to 30 to the 70 plus you know that even that is is a sizable change that would be scary for me if i the scariest thing for me if i were owning an agency would be if i have a new creative team just for the sake of the conversation coming in how do they integrate and internalize the culture and community that we've built. Can, are they coming in that this is a job, I'm going to get a brief, and it's just every agency is interchangeable, but the name of the shop is the only difference? Or is it someone who is actually going to enhance and, and help flourish or flesh out the vision that we had? And that's a that's a tough one. Well, that's a tough one because that's talent. That, that that's called the talent game, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we definitely are always in search of people who can do the latter to, to embellish to build upon what we've been doing. And not we're not looking for people to kind of just fall in line and take the brief, but we are looking for people who can kind of add it and take yeah. us to another level. Plus one the, and the, the people that got you to where you are. Might not be the people that get you to where you're going. That's a great point. I know you don't work directly with them, but Danae and Madison are, <laughs> that's a good catch. They're awesome. No, and, um, you know, not, not only do I hear that a lot in my 24 hours down here um, on campus, um, but other folks within the uh, city are mm -hmm. like, whoa, you got them. Yeah. So we're, we're, we feel very lucky. Um, they've been working uh, on lottery and um, we also have some project work with Nike Air Society. So mm -hmm. they've been off, you know, doing some run and gun stuff on that, some developing some beautiful um, uh, concert ready stuff for a, a new Nike launch That's for awesome. women. So so they, they've been fantastic. I feel honored to be able to have known them and mentored them. Um, so you've mentioned this and I just want to hear it again because I just want to confirm if I'm right. What what do you love? What's the thing that excites you? In this business, whether it's the business side of the business or the creative side of the business, what, what what's what's the thing that gets you going? What do you like? I like I like making. I like making things. I like making beautiful things. I do like the production side of it. You know, mm -hmm. one of the when I did take a break um, once, uh, I went and did PA work. I worked for oh, production companies, 
and um, and one of the jobs I had was uh, for a Cliff Freeman job um, to go up in a B three bomber and push um, guys out of the airplane, um, and they would do some sort of parachute thing and land. And I think it was a beer commercial, and um, I would be in the back of the plane with the pilots, and I was in this kind of like hollowed out plane. <laughs> all by myself with these pilots that were going to land and we would go up and down 10 different times to do this throughout the day. Um, parallel parking a 15 passenger van in Chinatown in San Francisco, oh you know, gosh. highlights like that. <laughs> That's cool. Um, but I really like the process. Mm -hmm. I do like the process of making, um, I like ideating, but I really like the part where it's like, okay, now we're going to get into production and now we're going to be meeting new people and part of the um, communicating of the vision and sharing vision and, and, and working with the production community yeah, that, right. that works quickly and to the, kind of... And elevate it too. Often. And elevate it and let's, let's compose this shot. I love photography. I love composition. Um, so I like to make. That's cool. In your experience and in your philosophical view of the creative process in advertising, if you have a hundred coins that you can spend on a project, the ideally, how many coins are spent on input? How many coins are spent on ideation? How many coins are spent on production? What value is the most important to make the work great? What's the most important of those three? How would you rank those three? Well, I think the, um, the first 33 <laughs> coins this is 100 coins, right? 100, 100 coins. 100 coins. One, one, one Mario life. Yeah. I would take, uh, I would, uh, honestly, I would take, I would take 33 Mario life coins. Right. And it's that, it's that insight. It's that, Huge. it's that, it's that so strategy. Full third is the input. Yeah, yeah. I need the input to kind of inspire. And we, we often, you know, we work in heat areas where it's like, okay, so, Maybe it's not one brief, you know. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's oh, that's one, interesting. Maybe it's one brief, but there's a couple different paths because what we find is clients they tend to agree to a brief, but then they don't adhere to a brief. Right, right. So if we can kind of walk them through, oh, it's the all know it when I'll see it brief. You mean there is that, yeah. and so let's give ourselves the opportunity to say, well, let's play in these kind of sub strategic areas because. Let's put a little more flesh on those bones and and kind of see if those things hunt because there's a lot of, is this what you meant? Right. Because just to be able to kind of sign off and say, well, yeah, technically that's what the brief says. But I'm feeling this other one a but lot But I'm more. feeling this right. other thing. Right. Right. So I would take 33 coins Well, those that. start to bleed into the next one anyway because a great... They do. A great insight becomes your idea. That's correct. Right. That's correct. So that's why we quickly <clears throat> want to get into... And, you know, maybe I would spend... I don't know. I'll take 40. 40 coins for the ideation and wow, development. Wow, you, you, you don't have a lot for... Okay. Well, I guess where I'm going with this is once I get to production, and certain clients are definitely this way. I'll use you 27 for production. Okay. I'll take it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, unfortunately, because production gets less and less. I mean, it's like you're doing one-day shoots or you're right. maybe doing two-day shoots. Right. Um, and so the ability to kind of like... I mean, by the time you get a pre-pro done, what you're saying. the pre-pro has been done before the pre-pro. Mm -hmm. All the big decisions right. that have to be made, by the time you have a pre-pro, it's just like, hey, this is just, you know, we're right. measuring twice here because we're actually shooting tomorrow. Right. So in the old days where it was like, you do a pre-pro, then there'd be two days for, oh, let's get together all those things that we may have missed. It's like, no, 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 you are doing a pre-pro and the next day you're, right. you're on set. So... It's not that I don't want to have any more than 27 coins for production, um, but because we involve our production partners early in, early on in the process, oh, the full 27 <laughs> coins well, can the, actually go towards the, the middle section. So it bled back. Yeah. Yeah. Into the, into the ideation. That's right. Yeah. That's that right. We, we like to bring them along. Uh, Groupon, we do that. We do that on Chili's. We ask. Groupon work is great. I love it. I love the Groupon stuff. I really cool. do. Yeah. Great. Really, really, it's really awesome. like it. I love the, the, the launch of the campaign. I love the Tiffany Haddish stuff. I think that the insight about experience is fucking on point. I think it's great. 
So that's enough for Thank me you. kissing ass. I'm not kissing. No, ass. we love it. We're I, you know what I, you know, we, and I do mean this. You know, it's nice to hear that 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 people um, genuinely like that. And you know, today I want to sh- I wanted to share a lot of stuff, but we get other clients saying. I want what you did on Groupon. Right. And it's like, okay. But don't you want to say, well, what do you think we did on Groupon? Like, what, what is it that you're buying? Because we're not going to do that. No. But what, what's the, what's the, what do you, that, how you I framed want... it, how you, how, you know, I like how you, how you uh, spun it. How okay, you're, good. You're strategic because we right. are very, you know, there's this old, like, be careful, your strategy is showing. That's my wife says that a lot. And we know that. Yeah. But the truth is, <clears throat> How can we do it in a way where it doesn't feel no, so? No, that doesn't feel naked to me that, at all, yeah. the Groupon stuff. It's, I always say that you're, our job as creatives is to make people feel the strategy without realizing that they just like read the strategy mm-hmm. or saw the strategy. Yeah. All right, so final question. Knowing what you know now, if you could go back in time to the day you walked out of graduation at DePauw mm-hmm. University um, in, in Indiana, uh, what would you whisper in young Matt's ear? What do you wish? You, what, what 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 would arm you well if you, if you could go back and tell yourself something? Uh, I would say start your own business sooner. Now that's not to say start it tomorrow. I think you can still get you can still learn a lot, but I think because the world works the way it works right now, which is quickly. <laughs> On demand, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I would I would have started. I think I would have convinced Tom and Nick oh. to start it sooner than we did. Interesting, but that's I mean that's that's probably that's an pretty easy, small. That's an easy answer. Yeah. That's not that big. Yeah. Um, that's fine. That's your answer. You got another one. I, I, I got to get a better one. The wheels are spinning. Get a better one. Don't I owe you a better one? I don't know. I would you have. Like, could you have convinced them? Would you have done that? I mean, I don't, I know. don't know if I could have because you know what? It's timing, right? And and the timing was right. You know, Tom was in a was in a uh, large position, and I think what's you know, been the downside of doing it now or five nothing, years ago? Right? Nothing's been the downside of doing it now. Um, in fact, it's probably. Um, better now because my kids don't really want to see me um yeah, as teenagers. teenagers so it's kind of works it well, kind of works out well it's funny you said talk about kids because i talk i think about this with my kids so i i had my son when i was 40 years old so it's kind of old but like if i had my kid when i was 28 or 9 i would have been a shitty dad like the, and, and the same thing now you're a kind of a dad of o- o'keefe reinhard paul would you have been as good of a dad of a leader the maturity this, that it takes you know if you'd done it earlier so I don't know that's you know what that's a really good point I think I, I think I was able to I will say the one thing I mean looking back I mean again in 08 going down to LA and and letting go 40% of the staff oh, it was God. kind of like a I was able to kind of coach flag football. I was kind of able to yeah. do a lot of things that um, yeah. I'm glad I was there for because there's been plenty of times when I wasn't around. Yeah, um, that's great. And so, um, you know, you just be the best husband and dad that you can be. Yeah, that's great. All right, so are you okay with giving out an email address? Yeah, yeah. It is, uh, I'm going to spell it out because no matter what, I always get a T at the end of uh, my name, even though it's not spelled that way. It's Matt, M-A-T-T, dot Reinhard, R-E-I-N-H-A-R-D. You get a T after the D often? People get, people want to put a T on everything. At? At O-K-R-P dot com. And the website is O-K-R-P dot com. Yes. Yes, that's easy enough. Yes, we, uh, in, in the early days of O-K-R-P, um, purchased the URL from Oklahoma Record Pool. Um, it had been dormant, and so there was some high stakes negotiation with the gentleman out of uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. What is a record pool? He had a he had like it was kind of like a music blog type thing. Oklahoma Record Pool. That's random. Well, we couldn't secure that URL until we went through Tulsa. Oh my goodness. Listeners, you can always reach me at Dan's Podcast at Mac.com. I've had that electronic mail address since before you uh, left middle school. Um, the, also, like the Facebook page, please, facebook.com slash DGMS Podcast. I'll have pictures, links, 
etc. Uh, podcast is always available on your Apple Podcast app. Uh, leave a review if you're in, so inclined at the iTunes store. I'll be back in a couple of weeks with another conversation. Until then, thanks for listening. And Matt, thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. Listeners, we'll see you. Bye. Awesome. That's great.